everyone. All right. Hi, everyone. I think it is working again now. Sorry about that. I uh, went to start up again, and then it had to make a new link. And then even once I had that up and running, um, I had the chat, but then it was telling me nobody was here. It also says that there's trouble with the video. Let me know if it's smooth on your end. Um, don't think it's my tech in this particular case. I wonder if maybe YouTube's having a little hiccups today. Because uh, I made sure ahead of time to test out my bandwidth and I rebooted the computer to make sure everything was running well and everything. So hopefully it's smooth even though YouTube is giving me a little yellow banner here um, saying that it might not be. So, oh good, Carrie Ann says it's as smooth as butter. Thank, I'm glad to hear it. So hopefully it will work okay. Thank you all for joining me and for um, bearing with me through the, uh, the tech here. So, you know, as usual, I love to hear where you all are tuning in from. I know um, I recognize a bunch of you, but looks like there might be one or two new people um, in the chat. So let me know where you're tuning in from. And sorry if there's a little noise in the background. Um, you know, it's still, uh, everybody's still home all the time. So you might hear a child occasionally. Um, and uh, let's see, John's in California. Good to hear. I hope you all are doing well. I know it's been it's been quite a time lately between all of the different world events going on and um, even with all the social distancing in the last two and a half months, I see, somehow have got a fever. Um, luckily, not too bad at the moment. So hopefully, I'll my energy will stay up. But if I get a little wilty, then it's it's, it's, uh, it's not because I'm not happy to be here. It's probably because of that. So let's see, and uh, David is in Benbury, UK, uh, Bibia is in the Netherlands, Florin is, uh, who goes by Mega, I guess, I don't know how you pronounce that, Florin, Mega Friedge or something like that, um, is in Poliesti, Romania, Carrie's in Ottawa, Canada, A, <laughs> um, all right, Greg's in Ohio, Vernon's in Brazil, Armand in Paris, Inkspills in Delaware. I have family from Delaware, actually. And let's see. Um, and I'm probably going to totally butcher the pronunciation here. Hawaii, Hawaii revisited in the Netherlands. I'm not sure. You'll have to correct me on that one. Uh, James is uh, tuning in from Maryland. Uh, there's Rachel, who's also in New Orleans. Um, Malcolm's at Ohio and I guess interrupted his workout for this. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, PM is also in France. Agnes in Nashville. Um, Jabebe in Argentina. Welcome back. Carlos in Mexico. Rob is finally back. And Rob, I believe if I remember correctly, you're in Houston, right? Um... Let's see, um, Tomas is in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Oh, so we have, we got multiple people from Argentina today. Cool. Celtic Tiger um, is having sound difficulty. Well, that's too bad. But I know from, since you've told me before that you're in Ireland. <laughs> um, I hope, uh, hope that that uh, sorts out right. All right, well, thank you again, for all of you, for joining me. Um and one of the things I was, um, I've been thinking about, because as you guys know, I've been putting together um, this course, which I know you've got somebody, people keep asking, when is it going to be ready? It's going to be about two, three weeks. You'll, you'll be hearing more really soon. Um, but as I'm putting all of the materials together, I've, I've taught the materials many times, but I have to say I'm reworking it um, this time around. And so as I've been putting things together and expanding it and, um, freshening it up, updating it and so forth, it's been giving me a lot of ideas of, of things that I can share on these live streams and in other places. So I was going to bring you another little sort of snippet from, uh, another part of the course where I talk a bit about dates and how to read Egyptian dates. And one of the things that I think is important to, um, bring up is, 
how that compares to how we actually look at ancient Egyptian history today and how we divide it up. Um, Because it's really, in some ways, extremely different from how the ancient Egyptians looked at things. And in some ways, it's actually a bit similar. Um, And I'll explain what I mean in a minute. And uh, Joanna has joined us. Uh, Welcome, Joanna. And good Celtic Kiger has um, sound back again. Uh, I st- I, yeah, I still don't understand that the, the name that's a version of Donald Duck's nephew's <laughs> name. I can't remember Donald Duck's nephew's name. Huey? Is it Huey? Is that what it is? You're writing Huey. Uh, that now I think I, f- I think I got it. You can let me know if that's what it was. Well, at least now if I figured it out, I won't forever be looking at it like I don't know what to say for that. That makes a little bit more sense with the I-J on the end. Okay. Yeah. Got it, Huey. So, all right, let me switch over to some visuals I had for you guys. So, um, yeah, I totally didn't remember Donald Duck's nephew until I was thinking about talking it through, and then I was like, oh, wait, Huey. I think that's it. Um, so I wanted to start by talking a little bit about how we in modern times talk about ancient Egyptian history and how we divide it up. You guys have probably heard me say these some of these terms a million times like when I talk about the Middle Kingdom and things like that um but the one of the first things I like to always point out when I talk about ancient Egypt really is how much time we're really talking about too so if we even just limit ancient Egypt and this is really pretty limited but if we just limit it from say political unification um at the beginning of what we might call the dynastic period you know, this is super rounded for the early dates, but in the neighborhood of 3100 BC or so, up until the death of Cleopatra VII, that's the famous Cleopatra during the Ptolemaic period. And you really could extend this further. I mean, Egyptian culture doesn't suddenly cease with her death. It keeps going into the Roman period and so forth. But even if we just restrict it for, for argument's sake, some people cut it off there to this period, you've still got actually... In a tremendously long amount of time, about about 3,000 years, that actually places Cleopatra VII closer to us today than she was to the time when the Giza pyramids were built. Um, and I use, you know, the U.S. as a reference here because that's where I'm from, but you could pop in your own um, reference from wherever you're from and, and compare it on this sort of visual timeline. Um, and, and you can see it really reminds you of how much of a vast amount of time we're talking about when we talk about ancient Egypt. And so because it was so large, things changed a lot over time. Um, you know, you can imagine it's, we're not the same as our ancestors were a couple hundred years ago. Imagine a thousand years ago or 2000 years ago. Um, our daily lives are really different. The way we think are really different. Um, our languages are even, even if we've, our families haven't moved around and we're still in the same place, the languages have changed a lot. So... It's um, yeah. James points out that she's closer to the, to the uh, to the iPhone. <laughs> um, that's a that that's another that's a good modern analogy. I should probably update my uh, my comparisons to uh, tech like that. Um, but it it's just one of these things to think about when we talk about ancient Egyptian time, and that because it was so long ago and our evidence is somewhat limited, we tend to kind of lump a lot of stuff together. Um, but it was um, a probably really quite different both over time and also regionally within the country too. So since it is this huge amount of time, we have modern methods of talking about different parts of it uh, that we divide up based on the political situation. So this is a lot of different little labels and I'm, I'm not going to like read them all off to you or anything, but the basic ideas are modern larger divisions of ancient Egyptian history are based around the idea of whether the country is politically unified or not. So the periods that we call like the early dynastic period, old kingdom, middle kingdom, new kingdom, um, and to some extent the late period, um, also Ptolemaic period, Roman, etc. These are times when Egypt was not necessarily always ruled by indigenous Egyptians, but the whole country was politically unified under one ruler, whether they were Egyptian or otherwise, such as in the late period and later, then you have a lot of foreign rulers. Um, 
Whereas the ones that are called intermediate periods are the times when Egypt is politically fractured to some extent. So, um, and keep in mind, this doesn't necessarily mean that viewpoints were very different in those different times, but it's more just like whether you have one ruler who has control over the whole territory. And in the first intermediate period, second intermediate period, third intermediate period, you have usually multiple rulers and or a king who doesn't control the whole country. He might control part of the northern part of the country, for example, and then you have a bunch of local governors in the south who control their own areas. That happens a lot. So this is how modern scholars can talk about this. And it's interesting because these terms actually didn't all come about at the same time. This was something I actually didn't, I didn't learn about the history of the terminology until relatively recently. Um, I knew they were modern, but it didn't know exactly when the terms came along. And interestingly, I, I just found out um, from some friends and colleagues recently, because I'd never really thought about it before, that terms like third intermediate period are actually really recent from like the 1970s. Um, some of the other, a lot of the other terminology is older for different time periods, um, particularly like old kingdom, middle kingdom, new kingdom. But it all kind of came about piecemeal over the last like 150 years of Egyptology. But the, so the interesting thing is this is a completely modern way of looking at this in terms of um, that these period names are totally made up in modern times. They're not based on anything the ancient Egyptians would have called these times uh, or anything like that. But interestingly, they do in some ways kind of mimic the Egyptian cultural idea of um, the time periods at the time. So you guys have probably heard of Ma'at, for example. This is something that is variously translated. I lean towards the translation of divine order. Ma'at is basically the way that things are supposed to run. It's the social order. It's the way you should act. Um, it's basically, you know, how everything is supposed to run if it's running correctly. Isfet, on the other hand, is an Egyptian term that you could translate as perhaps chaos. And so it's really the, like the opposite of ma'at. And the ancient Egyptians oftentimes will portray the idea of ma'at versus isfet. So, for example, when you see scenes of a king fighting foreign enemies, or as I showed you guys a couple weeks ago, trampling them under his feet or something like that, this is one of the ways that the king is shown keeping Ma'at running, right? And keeping these forces of Isfet, including foreign enemies, under control. But Isfet can even be within Egypt too, and um, various things, even wild animals can represent Isfet. Another thing is when the social order, as, as the elites knew it, broke down. So for example, in the Middle Kingdom, I'll go back to this for a moment so you can see the sequence again. In the Middle Kingdom, uh, a lot of the, the sort of intellectuals and elite you might think about uh, during the Middle Kingdom wrote literature that reflected back on what we now call the First Intermediate Period, this time before the Middle Kingdom when there was political fracturing in the country. And no doubt this is literature. It's not really meant to be written history the way we think of history. So it's it's not meant to be how we would expect history to be a, as a, like a very strictly factual thing. It's definitely a middle kingdom interpretation of the first intermediate period. But in these uh, interpretations, they talk about how horrible it was and how everything was backwards and everything was like the opposite of Ma'at. It was basically like chaos. Um, and some of these things are things that are very obviously bad, like shortages of food. The Nile ran low, there were droughts. Um, and so forth. And those are obvious things that it's going to be bad for everybody, right? Uh, but there are other things they talk about too as being really bad. So for example, uh, those you know who had been wealthy were now poor, and those who were poor were now wealthy. <laughs> um, and these are things we wouldn't necessarily always agree as being a bad thing today. Um, I suppose it depends on probably where you are. Certainly, it sounds funny to us to say it's a bad thing for the for the poor to get ahead, right? Um, we would think at least that part ought to seem not a bad thing. But from the elite Egyptian viewpoint, the people who are actually writing this literature, they view this as a contrary to ma'at, contrary to the usual order um, kind of thing. So they talk about this. So in a way, because they look at these periods of 
political disunity and where things are not running the way that they now, in retrospect, looking at it, think they should have, they also kind of made this distinction between what we would call intermediate periods and these united um, times. So interestingly, I, I don't think it was the modern intention of anybody who came up with these terms to actually mimic that, but um, I've always found it intriguing how it does kind of mimic in some ways the Egyptian ideals, at least at the higher end of the social stra strata uh, where people really don't want change. Um, now, within that time, we also use, you've probably heard me talk about dynasties and other people and read about them. We use this system of 30 or 31 dynasties, which is another way to divide up ancient Egyptian history by sort of grouping uh, lists of kings together. This is not always strictly chronological. It's really kind of a messy system. They don't necessarily all go um, sequentially, one after another, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, etc. Some of them are concurrent during these intermediate periods when you have multiple kings ruling. Um, so it's a messy thing, and I'm not going to get into the full details of the dynastic system, which was created um, by a priest named Manitho in the third century BC. It was uh, commissioned by one of the early Ptolemaic kings who were of uh, of Greek uh, heritage who were ruling Egypt at the time. And it's, um, but it's an interesting thing. And I have a video on chronology. If you go, it's one of my early ones. It's called, I think I call it history and chronology or something like that. Um, and I go a lot more into Manitho and, and how he came out with his dynasties, if you're interested. Uh, but that's another way. So this sort of like the larger periods overlap with Manitho's original lists of dynasties that we also use. And while Manitho's list of dynasties is ancient, it's also not necessarily the way ancient Egyptians looked at their own history for most of the time. Um, perhaps by Manitho's time, they might have been looking at it this, a bit more this way. You do have lists of kings earlier on, for sure. They did like to do that kind of sequential listing of kings. But they didn't break them up into these kind of dynasty groups. So that's definitely something that comes along a bit later, but we still use um, today. So again, there's a bit of overlap with the ancient viewpoint versus the modern in this way, because it is an old system, but it's not necessarily the way that um, ancient Egyptians would have thought of it for most of their own history. So we do tend to talk about things in terms of particular kings, reigns, dynasties, periods, and so forth. And this is somewhat similar to the Egyptian system, but it's also somewhat different as we've been talking about. And when they get into really specifically dating things, like down to the year, they do this specifically by king's reign. And so we have to some extent adopted this in our discussions of ancient Egypt too, because our records, our written records at least, come down to us this way. So there is some overlap there, but it's not the way that we usually look at history, I would say, in the modern West. We tend to look at these larger sort of periods, and we think of things in a sort of linear, sequential um, continuous flow of history, whereas the ancient Egyptians actually date things starting over again with every king. So, and I discuss this in that chronology video too, but it's basically equivalent to if we went by presidents in the United States, for example, you know, 1962, for example, would be year two under President Kennedy. Um, or if we jumped ahead 20 years, we could say the same thing. 1982 was the year two under President Reagan, for example. Um, so this is how the ancient Egyptians did it. They didn't have this sort of continuous counting up sequential thing. They went by king's reigns. So that brings me to at least a sort of brief explanation of how they did write the dates. Now, very often they'll write dates like I'm going to show you, and they don't even necessarily tell us which king they're talking about which is really frustrating for us in modern times because we can get a general idea of the time period usually on a monument based on its context where it was found um, and oftentimes to some extent from its artistic style as well. But if we don't have a specific king's name, we, we usually can't get that specific as like a particular king's reign. So we do like it when we can find a king's name on things, um, but they don't always oblige us in that way. And very often they don't put years at all on things but it is nice when they do. 
So one of the, the main way you'll see it when they do write it um, is this way. They start with the phrase Ren Pet Sep, and this changes a little bit over time. Ren Pet Sep has a little bit different meaning in the Old Kingdom. Um, it related to a census that was taken regularly of cattle and really means like the, the year of the occurrence or time, basically meaning when there was a count. And so they do the years a little bit differently at that time. But if we're talking about Middle Kingdom and onward, this really just means whatever year of the particular king's reign. So we translate it as regnal year for that reason. Regnal meaning part of a king's reign. So I've been doing number videos recently. I so I won't not going to repeat like all the numbers stuff. You can check out the numbers videos for specifics on how to do ones and tens and hundreds and so forth. Although you're not going to find anything more than ones and tens in years, of course, because we don't have any pharaohs who live to be to rule for a hundred or more years. So, for example, if we had a king who was in his fourth year of rule and we dated a monument um, that was built during that time, it would say regnal year four. Then with the preposition her, meaning it, it can have a few different meanings depending on the context. In this context, in English, under makes the most sense. Hem, and hem is an interesting word that you'll find different translations for in this context. So some people translate it as the majesty um, of the, and then we'll talk about the king a little further on in this sequence. A more recent suggestion of a translation is the person, that it really has to do with meaning um, sort of the physical incarnation of the king rather than uh, something a little more abstract like like majesty. So the um, so this is, a, you'll see it oftentimes in books, you'll see like under the majesty of the king of Upper and Lower Egypt or something like that. Um, more modern translation is the person of the dual king. Uh, Nesut or Nesu, scholars sometimes transliterate the T, sometimes they don't. Um, Nesut BT, sometimes you'll see translated as the king of Upper and Lower Egypt. This is an older interpretation, again. Um, more recent interpretations suggest that this actually has to do with the dual nature of the king being both a physical, sort of actual human being on earth, as well as having a more divine celestial kind of role as well um, and this is alluding to his the two parts of his role rather than to ruling two different parts of Egypt um, that's an argument that I have not made myself this is that other scholars have done so I'm not going to go super deep into that there are article there's some articles out there on it which I could I don't have references offhand but I could dig them up if, up if any of you are um, interested in that but in any case so I would translate it this way. Regnal year four under the person of the dual king. Then usually after that, you get the throne name of the king. So in this case, I used the example of Menchepere, which is the throne name of the pharaoh you're more likely to know as Tutmosis III. Um, and he has a ton of monuments, so you'll see his name a lot on things. So you'll see this um, very frequently on stele, on temple walls, uh, even in tombs sometimes. And on legal documents, although I have to say on legal documents, that's one of the places where they very often don't name the king. They just give you a year, um, presumably because the the um, document was, you know, being read by people at that time and they would know when you meant. <laughs> and so they didn't feel it necessary nece uh, to always write the uh, king's name in with that. But it can be very frustrating for us today because we're like, okay, we'd like to know a little more precisely when this thing was written. But um, they don't, didn't always oblige us in that way. Um, so just to put it all kind of together as one flowing uh, sentence, we have to add in a couple words, of course, in English that they don't always use in Egyptian. So, for example, there was no what we call definite article like the. Um, and sometimes, as I talked about, I think it was last week, um, they'll just put two nouns next to each other, and it has the meaning of as, uh, as if you had of in between. So we add in the of. So you get regnal year four under the person of the dual king Menchepere, or Menchepera, if you prefer. As I've said before, there's no no vowels, and we're interpreting what's actually an ein uh, in uh, re or ra there. So neither of those pronunciations is really how the Egyptians did it. Uh, they're just modern conventions. Now, you could do this with a, a larger number of years, of course, too. This is the exact same thing, except that I put 36 years in here instead of four. Um, 
So I just wanted to give you an example of where some of these show up. And it's sort of a particularly interesting one because it gets into a, a um, scholarly debate over history in ancient Egypt. So this is a stele that's in the uh, Egyptian Museum in Cairo. This is the inventory number that I've given you here, um, the catalog number. Um, and it's a photo I took when I was uh, in Cairo. This one's on display in, in uh, one of the Middle Kingdom uh, areas there. Although, I don't know, with the moving things around now and for setting up for the Grand Egyptian Museum, it's possible it could have moved. Um, but when I was last there, which was many years ago, it was still there. Um, and uh, if you zoom in on the top section here, you'll notice there's more than one cartouche. Now, you could have two cartouches for the same king, because as I, I think I talked about this some last week, although sometimes it's hard for me to keep track of which thing I talked about something in. So maybe I talked about it somewhere else. Um, oftentimes you will see two names of the king, his, his birth name, which is the name he actually had before he became king, and also the throne name. Those are the two names that can occur in cartouches. So oftentimes you'll see two for one king. However, on occasion, this is not super, super common, but you will on occasion see monuments like this one where we actually have cartouches of two different kings, the throne names of both of these kings in this case. And then I know it's even zoomed in. It's a little small, and unfortunately at some point some paint has gotten onto the edges of the stela, so it makes it a little harder to make out. But at the top um, of the stela, you can see it has... A shortening of this. It doesn't actually say regnal year, it just has year um, here and the sign, and then it, it reads from the center outwards. So you've got two different sections um, of dates here. So on the right, it says year 20 under the person of, and then you read down to the cartouche, the dual king, Kheperkare, Ankhjet, living forever. And then if you read the left hand side, starting in the middle, I probably should have written this out for you guys. Apologies, I didn't think of that ahead of time. <laughs> um, it's, it says year 30, because so you see there's three of the 10 sign there. Cher, under, hem, the person, n, of. And then again, we move down to the cartouche. They've put the dual king inside the cartouches this time on both sides. The dual king, Sahatep Ibre. So I probably should have even read the one on the left first, but in any case, the idea is you actually have two different kings here. They are you, ones you will know more commonly by the names Amenemhat I and Senwazirat I, who were the first two kings of the 12th dynasty during the early Middle Kingdom. So again, bringing in uh, those modern conventions of dating of how we think about this. Um, and it actually ties into a debate in Egyptology about what does this mean when you have a monument with two kings uh, who have dates like this and they're one king who ruled after the other. So many Egyptologists, I think these days a majority, although it kind of shifts back and forth, interpret this as evidence for what we would call a co-regency. That is that while the older king, the father, is still king, the son becomes a kind of junior king who rules alongside him. And instead of waiting for the older king to die first before becoming king. And so this is an interesting case here. In this case, if we were to interpret it this way, the idea would be that this stela is dated uh, to the 30th year of Amenemhet I, which is also the 10th year of Senwazir at the first. So in other words, they've been ruling side by side for 10 years or almost 10 years at this point. Um, now, there are some scholars who who dispute this and actually interpret this as the dates don't actually mean that, that they might have been um, separate dates uh, when certain important things happened in a person's career, for example, or other reasons why they might cite more than one date. Uh, and uh, there have been some recent works on, on that, like, um, for example, uh, Lisa Haney has a very recent book that just came out last couple months on specifically, especially on the art of co-regency in the Middle Kingdom and how you can see this sort of political method coming out in the visual record as well. Um, so it's a it's an interesting kind of tangle. I have to say, I I, I personally fall on the side of believing in co-regencies, uh, but it's not exactly my specialty of research that I've dug into like 
super, super deep like Lisa has. Um, but uh, I, I think these days most are kind of are leaning in that direction as well. So let me see. I know that you guys have a bunch of comments. Um, so... Uh, Uh, do, do, do. Let's see. Um, Malcolm was saying that King, Pharaoh, and King are two different things. Actually, Pharaoh is just a Greek interpretation of the Egyptian term per aa, which means literally means like the large house or the great house which was a term that started to be used for the royal palace in ancient Egypt. And so they um, then transferred that name also to the king. And so they started referring to the king and then in the new kingdom as per aa also, and that becomes pharaoh in Greek. So it actually just means um, king. It's kind of like the way that the U.S. press, when they talk about something the president does, they might talk about that as if it's the White House. They'll say, today the White House released a statement, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, they don't mean the building. <laughs> that it, They mean the administration and the president. Or in the UK, you might say that about the prime minister and other ministers on Downing Street or something. Um, same kind of idea. So king and pharaoh are actually totally interchangeable um, terms in that way. Um, uh, Welcome, Hamid. Thank you. I, you're tuning in from Egypt. Good to good to see some people from Egypt as well. So, Tomas, yep, I was talking about co-regency. Dakota asked if, if pharaohs, uh, were they always born from incest? So in other words, brother-sister marriages. They were not always. Um, that changes in different time periods. It's especially strong in like the 18th dynasty. We see it really well. But um, sometimes we also just don't know as much about the family background of the women that Pharaoh is married. So sometimes it's hard to tell. Um, but you certainly have ca some cases that are very clear, like Amenhotep III, who actually publicizes that his wife is not of a royal background. Um, and so we have lots of records of him talking about that. Um, let's see. Carlos, that's a good question whether they have a word for co-regency. I, I do not believe that they do. Um, and that's sort of one of the things that complicates the interpretation uh, as well is uh, that they don't talk about co-regency outright. There are some sort of vague references to it. Let me go ahead and turn the slides off. So, for example, there's a, there's a piece of literature also from the early Middle Kingdom that is written as if it's written by Amenemhat I. So one of the kings who's name I just showed you on that stela. And he is written as if it's an instructional text from him to his son, San Wadzirat I. Now, we don't believe he actually wrote it himself, and it was probably written actually during his son's reign rather than his reign. Um, but it talks about how um, he was attacked. So we think he might have actually been assassinated. It's one of these things that the Egyptians generally don't write down, and so it's very hard to know about these kinds of situations. Um, but in any case, he talks about being attacked, and he says that he was attacked before... Sorry, some traffic going by, people honking at each other. Um, he says that it was before he could... I forget the exact phrasing. It was like before he could appoint him or before he could make it known that um, he wanted his son to be king as well or something like that. So some people take this as a reference to the idea of that he was going to establish Senwazert the first in a co-regency, but was this attack, which maybe wasn't successful, happened before that. It's hard to know because it's really a piece of literature that may be based partially on historical events, um, but it's it's very vague uh, in that way. Um, Malcolm's asking how you say prince in Greek. I actually have no idea. If anybody here knows Greek... <laughs> You can and like I don't know Greek myself. Um, I, I never learned Greek, so um, ah, good. Inks Bill already answered that at least for modern Greek. Um, all right. Oh, hi, Brian. Didn't see you there. Glad you were able to 
pop in. So yeah, if it's and it's uh, like with the question um, that uh, I was just answering from from Carlos about the word of for co-regency, there isn't one. But and this is one of the things that kind of plagues us sometimes in Egyptology that there is of, oftentimes we have these sort of vague references that we're not sure how to interpret, and they seem to imply that some kind of um, intrigue might have happened, but they don't come right out and say it in the in the text. And so then we're left to kind of like, okay, was King assassinated or not? So even when you have trial documents, so for example, during the time of Ramses III, we have actually trial documents talking about an assassination attempt. We don't know if the assassination attempt was successful. That's one of the interesting things about it is... Um, the ancient Egyptians don't write, like to write down about people dying or people having been killed. And so they never really tell us clearly in there whether the king died or not. Um, they make references to the conspirators not being successful, but sometimes it sounds like it might be just sort of a perforce um, standardized thing that they would say about the gods not allowing bad things to happen rather than it being a literal historical account so um, uh, Carlos is asking uh, also do we think that linguists are still needed in Egyptology or excavations I, you know I think it's both and I think that one of the things that's happening a lot more in Egyptology these days and I think is a really good trend somebody asked me about this um, actually during a, a job interview several years ago about where I felt like you know, Egyptology was going today and where it should go. And this is one of the things I, I talked about is that I think that where we should go and where we are tending to go these days is working on a lot of um, material that's already been recognized before. And now I think excavations are still important as well. But there's so much material we already have on hand that either hasn't really been looked at closely or the last time it was looked at closely was 100 or more years ago. And oftentimes we know a lot more about the greater context now and can piece it together with more recent evidence that we have, which people at that time didn't. And so there's a lot of stuff for really kind of um, that's ripe for a more nuanced interpretation. This doesn't usually mean that we're like completely overthrowing like huge ideas about ancient Egypt, but in the scholarly world, they seem large because we're very focused on a lot of detail. Um, but it tends to be that the more nuanced things, the kinds of stuff you're not usually going to hear about on TV and, and things like that. Um, sorry, going with my wild hand gestures there. As I see my, myself come up on the, the YouTube stream is a little bit delayed, so I just see myself about a minute later <laughs> going, ah! Um, and, but it's a... Uh, so it's an interesting thing that keeps going, and I think that that's a really important thing. Also doing things like digitizing a lot of the material that we have so that it's accessible to more people. Um, that's Those are important initiatives as well. Con and conservation work to preserve the stuff we already have um, as well. So I think in, that can include that can include work on the language. There's definitely people making advances still on our understanding of Egyptian in terms of the really nitty gritty grammatical details. Um, sometimes the nitty gritty interpretations of particular words. And um, also there are people working on the phonology of the language, the sounds. I, in fact, I just got um, last week uh, excited because I've heard about it for months and finally out is a book by, um, by Jim Allen on ancient Egyptian phonology. So I haven't gone through the whole thing, but I've kind of flipped around it's kind of more of a reference work in a way. It's not so much of a narrative read. So I've just kind of hopped around from one section to another. It's it's divided up by sections of stages of Egyptian. It's it's not really um, for the faint-hearted, I have to say, even though it looks kind of small. It's it it's you know it's a super detailed kind of thing that probably would not be easy to follow if you don't have a background already um, in Egyptian. But um, it's it's interesting for me, and I, I'm using it to help inform you know my work further um as well 
So I think I think both are necessary. And in archaeology, of course, we have a lot of advances too, where we're using remote sensing a lot more than before. We're a lot more detailed um, and careful excavation methods than were used in the past. Uh, so oftentimes, a lot of excavations even are also re-excavating sites that have been excavated before, because a lot of times when they were excavated in the 19th or early 20th century, they just were not done at a very on a very detailed level and they weren't documented well at the time. And we can actually find out a lot by excavating the same sites over again, even though they're disturbed already from those earlier archeologists, we can still um, oftentimes find a lot more info than we had before. So new places are always interesting too, but there's also a lot of things we already know about that need more work, whether that's archeologically or, or in terms of text interpretations. Um, let's see. Uh, Kelsey Tiger asking, how do we know the date if there isn't actually a date on it? So there's lots of ways you can kind of tell that the language does change over time. So that gives us clues in terms of, um, to some extent, like the sentence structure, types of particles they use, things like that. If it's hieratic, the everyday kind of script they were using, the, um, the handwriting changes over time. Too. So there's a, a certain style to it. Now, you can't date it as precisely as a king's reign necessarily based on handwriting, but it will give you a at least um, somewhat general idea of what dynasty, probably what part of a dynasty, perhaps. Kind of depends on the time period and um, details. So as far as text goes, those are things, um, if it's a carved in stone and or with some other artistic representations, whether that be on papyrus or in stone, um, oftentimes the art style changes over time too. And so that can give us clues. Um, if it talks about certain people, they might be people that we know from other documentation, even if they're not Kings who can clue us in also, um, on the time period. So there's lots of, uh, things like that, that aren't as precise as say a year date, but can get us pretty close. So, um, I don't, a few of you, I think caught the talk I did for the American research center in Egypt a couple weekends ago. And one of the things I talked about is how I was able to date a bunch of the material from our collection at the university where I work, um, even though there's no there are no king's dates on it. And I'm able I was able to date it to write basically the middle of the reign of King Asur Khan II, which I never actually imagined I'd be able to date it that precisely. But I just it we just happened that it happened to me that this guy's funerary ensemble had a really good combination of materials that through the style and stylistic dating criteria that we have, I was able to narrow it down a lot along with some archival research into newspaper reports about the collection from the 1850s that gave it a little bit more insight too. So and sometimes we can actually get amazingly um, pretty narrow even without that. Um, so Dakota was asking any interesting laws. Yeah, the, the laws, we don't have written down clear codified laws until fairly late um, in pharaonic history but we get hints of them earlier on. So I don't want to get into a whole bunch of it because it could take a while, but just one example, um, for example, from some of these later laws, and it seems to hold true at least, at least some of the time earlier in Egyptian history is, for example, if a, if a couple were to um, split up as long as there was no serious fault on one side or the other, the collective property in a couple would be split with two thirds would go to the man and one third would go to the woman. Um, and it's similar for what, how they can hand down inheritance as well. So, and they can, and both women and men inherited property, unlike many other cultures. And um, women brought their own property into marriage oftentimes, and they could choose who would inherit it. Their husband didn't necessarily have control over that. Um, so we have cases, like I have a video that talks about uh, family life in ancient Egypt, and I talk about a woman named Naunacht from the New Kingdom, and she actually wrote a, a document that specifically stated that she had eight children, and her pro her property was to be divided up amongst five of them, and not the other three. She was completely disinheriting the other three. Um, and But it even sp explicitly states this doesn't include the property of her her husband, their father. Um, that that would be a separate matter, but her property would be handled that way. So there's things like that, which I find particularly interesting. Um, ink spill, talking about the evolution of vowels and nilotic branch would be interesting, certainly. 
I'm sure it would. And um, <laughs> my significant uh, my significant other is uh, concerned about my lighting. Apparently, he just came in and turned on a light over here, so my lighting has has balanced out. <laughs> Some you might have heard the click of the light switches. Um, I forgot to turn a light on before I started. That's a little bit overkill. I'll turn it down one. <laughs> it's a little too much light in my face. Um, so yeah, and Bibby, I know it's like what I was talking about before. There's a lot still being found, and there's lots in basements of museums and stuff that still need to be worked on. Um, oh, hi, Don. So you joined us. Um, so let's see. Oh, hi, Jay, also who's joined us. Um, all right. Um, <laughs> sweet of him. Yeah. Uh, he, um, I'm a, I, it's funny because I am a perfectionist in many ways, but when it comes to lighting and audio, he's more of a perfectionist than I am. So <laughs> he'll come in and, uh, and, uh, tweak stuff like that sometimes on me. Um, who wrote the laws? It's a good question. You know, I'm not sure we have good evidence for that. We certainly have royal decrees where kings are saying, like, this is how this is going to be, and, like, this property is going to now work this way or something like that, especially with sometimes with reorganizing the priesthood and things in temples and that kind of stuff. But we don't really get codified laws until really late. And I have to say that's stuff that late is not my specialty, so I don't recall. I have read up on it in the past, but I haven't looked lately, so I can't remember off the top of my head the full details of the context um, of some of that documentation. I think there might be a couple Egyptologists in the audience, so if anybody knows off the top of their head, they can um, feel free to, to share that. Um, so I, I don't believe that they were attributed to gods generally, although there might be some references to gods sometimes in them. Um, uh, Bibia says uh, that uh, he or she had learned that a man would walk into the house with his property and then if she was impressed, they would marry. Yeah, we actually don't know uh, most of the time how people went about getting married because we have absolutely no evidence for a marriage ceremony for most of Pharaonic history either. So we have references to couples and we have references to them splitting up and sometimes remarrying. We have references to people being widowed, things like that. Um, but we don't ever have references to a, like a marriage celebration or a marriage ceremony. Um, there just isn't anything. So as far as we can tell, um, as far as we can tell, there was no like religious ceremony, no, not even a um, legal ceremony necessarily. It seems like if a couple agreed to be married, that they were married. They moved in together. That was it. Um, yeah, so, oh, Carlos wants to know, do I teach things about Egyptology to my family? I, I don't usually explicitly, although they pick up a lot. Um, you know, people who aren't super into ancient Egypt probably don't want to hear about it that much. <laughs> um, but, uh, they definitely pick up some over time. Uh, you know, sometimes they watch other Egyptologists with me. They go to conferences with me. Um, they don't necessarily attend all the talks at conferences, granted, um, but uh, they see some of it and socialize with other Egyptologists with me and things like that. Um, and and we were together for a large part of when I was in grad school, so um, you know there was a lot of hanging out with other Egyptologists um, back then. So there's some of that. And actually, my my son recently has been telling me he wants to be an archaeologist. So he wants to do archaeology with me in the park and things like that lately. I, I have not pushed that though to be honest. And my, my friends in Egyptology have actually said, you got to dip that in the bud. You teach it, teaching him these, these, uh, unmarketable skills, right. And stuff like that, joking around. Cause we joke around a lot about that, um, <laughs> in archeology span and Egyptology. But, um, it's funny uh, how that works out sometimes. I mean, I do, he, he's the one who started noticing Egyptian stuff and noticing on my books and things like that and pointing it out. So I talked to him about it since he's interested, but I didn't like start pushing it on him or anything like that. Um, it shows up on TV so much and everything. He started recognizing things. So, um, uh, I think I'm going to wrap it up. Um, 
uh, Celtic Tiger asked about the onk in art. It's it's there a lot just because it is the way you write the word for life. And so it's both in straight up text as well as in sort of artistic symbolism represents life. So you'll see it a lot in terms of being offered from gods to kings, for example, or people holding it. It's it, it's um, a sign of life in that case. And Dakota's asking about Akhenaten. I feel, I know a fair amount. I have to say the Amarna period is not my specialty, and I'm I'm not a huge fan on digging real deep into the Amarna period. So I'm not the most up to date on it. I would say, but actually, my very first course in Egyptology was on the Amarna period. So it's um, it was my first official uh, introduction um, to ancient Egypt. So well, I know a bit, but I haven't really brushed up on the latest. I would say in the last few years. Um, it's a period. It's a small period of Egyptian history, and it's it's not the most interesting facet of it to me. So, I read a little bit here and there, but I don't um, keep up on a ton of it. So, yeah. So, thank you all for coming. And oh, thank you, Carrie Ann. <laughs> Carrie Ann, saying I'm a good storyteller. Well, I hope so. I said a lot of times it feels like I'm just babbling on about stuff. So I'm <laughs> glad to hear it. <laughs> it actually comes across well. Um, so Hank Spell says, hey, the monotheistic disaster period. Yeah, it's debatable whether it's really monotheistic. It's a it's it's a kind of a can of worms and um it it's hard because it um our evidence like any anywhere else is, is limited in the Amarna period. So um it's there's so much written on it with you know, with fairly limited Egyptian material. Um so it's yeah, anyway, it, it is kind of a can of worms with a whole lot of... Speaking of ink spill, it's, it, it is a period I tend to talk about having a lot of ink spilled on it. Um, so, all right, thank you all for coming. And um, <laughs> Celtic Tiger says, you think I kissed the Blarney Stone? I, I didn't think I was nearly good enough to have been somebody who kissed the Blarney Stone, uh, but thank you. I certainly do have some Irish ancestry, as you might have guessed from my appearance. Um, although less than half, you would think I would have more than I do. Um, I have a huge, you know, I'm a mutt, I'm a European mutt, a huge mix of, uh, of backgrounds there. Um, but uh, you're welcome. Oh, I'm glad it was fascinating, uh, Rob. And um, thank you again all for coming. And I do plan to do the same time next week. Um, and oh yes, Tomas is pointing out uh, that henotheism is a, is more accurate, and I would agree. That's that's how I would also interpret it. Um, and y'all can Google that if you're not sure what that means. <laughs> so I will see you again stream. And as usual, I will be around for the premieres of the videos for the next day of the week, same time, three o'clock Eastern, um, two Central, in the afternoon. And we'll be, I'll be doing up the last three number hieroglyphs. Um, in Egyptian the next few days so we get into the higher numbers and there's some interesting things that I was tempted to show you today but I decided not to preempt some of that stuff that's coming later in the week so I will see you all in there and hopefully also next week for a live streaming as well all right you have a good rest of your day and rest of the week take care <laughs>